Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Megan Doherty, the director of the Museum of the White Mountains. And as I sit in my office at the museum tonight, I am in Indakina, <laughs> the traditional and present homelands of the Abnaki, Penacook, and Webnaki peoples. And wherever, wherever you are tonight, um, you are also on native lands. And I encourage you to learn more about the indigenous presence in your area. Um, I'll put a couple of links in the chat for resources where you can learn more um, about where you are in, in North America. And for those of us in the Northeast, there's um, one that's specific to um, it's an organization here in New Hampshire, as well as the um, museum in Odenac in Quebec. So a couple of places to learn a little bit more um, and we'll um, you know, you can find more information there. And I am so delighted um, to have Jenny Bauer with us tonight. Um, and Jenny's uh, finishing up their PhD at UVM and we're gonna hear all about their research um, put into a package that just right for um, the general audience of the museum. So Jenny, thanks so much for agreeing to join us tonight. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, I'm really glad to be here and see some familiar faces in the audience and some folks that, that I don't know so well. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And uh, the topic uh, today, on a Thursday night, so congrats for coming out, is, um, is digging deeper, uncovering the stories of soil and rocks at Hubbard Brook. So a little about me, I'm originally from Missouri and then did an undergrad degree in geology in Ohio and then moved up to Vermont where I did a master's in geology and then I uh, started a PhD studying in Hubbard Brook. Uh, working with uh, soil scientists and geologists there to, uh, to work on my dissertation. Then I moved to North Carolina, where I am now. So it's 75 degrees here, a bit different than the Northeast. <laughs> and, um, and I'm currently employed as a research soil scientist at the Soil Health Institute. So tonight, I'm going to give a really brief introduction to the geology of Hubbard Brook, and then an introduction to the soils of this area, and uh, provide some highlights from my PhD research. This is one of my favorite field assistants uh, looking at a soil that we were digging during, during my work. Okay, so I love that I'm uh, <coughs> describing some of the Northeastern geology because I think I saw that a, a former student when I was a geology TA is in the audience and and he's a legit geologist professionally now. So that's great. <laughs> um, uh, so 420 million years ago, um, Laurentia, which would become the um, the uh, North, North America, the eastern part of North America, uh, had just undergone a mountain building event that formed the Green Mountains. And an island arc called Avalonia was starting to subduct under it. And uh, during this, the ocean in between them was filling up with sediments that were eroding from the Green Mountains and Avalonia. At this point, the Green Mountains might have been around as tall as the Andes which is pretty cool to think about. Uh, but all these ocean sediments were uh, uh, turned into sedimentary rock, which were then deformed and metamorpho metamorphosed to eventually form the presidentials. And this also formed some of the rocks at Hubbard Brook. So the presidentials might have been as tall as the Rockies. And as this happened, there was also some um, continental crust that melted and became um, igneous rocks that are also part of the landscape at Hubbard Brook. This, um, this continental uh, mountain building event uh, started to form what would be Pangaea. 
And um, after this, there was another collision that finalized Pangaea and formed the Southern Appalachians. And then ultimately Pangaea began to split apart, which formed the Atlantic Ocean in a process that is still continuing. Uh, and this, this also um, led to the uh, intrusion of some, some uh, basaltic dikes and mafic dikes that are in the, in the Northeast today. So if you wanna hear more about this or read more about this, I encourage you to check out the awesome book by Usden on the formation of the presidentials. And I know it's not quite Hubbard Brook, but it's close enough that we actually have some of the same rock types. So fast forward to 25,000 years ago, and um, the glacier was messing a lot of these rocks up by, um, by successive uh, um, advances and retreats. And uh, the Laurentide ice sheet uh, was, was at a glacial maximum around 25,000 years ago, but it had retreated and advanced quite a few times before then. Uh, so at this point, it was covering most of New England, uh, the ice is in white, and it had um, ground up a lot of these rocks that I um, described and blanketed New England in a mix of, of till and other sediments. So um, most of these sediments were actually deposited once the glacier was retreating around 14,000 years ago, and they helped form the soils that, um, that are there today. So uh, all of this shaped the landscape that underlies the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, which is a long-term ecological research site in the White Mountains. Megan um, did a great job with the land acknowledgement. Uh, it's within a Beneke territory and the Wabanaki Confederacy. I'm gonna give you a little zoom in with, uh, with an, uh, an elevation map. So this shows the, the surface topography of the watershed that I study within Hubbard Brook. And I just wanna um, give a quick view of some of those rock types I was talking about. So the Western half of Hubbard Brook is underlain by granodiorite, which uh, was part of that, um, that continental crust melt. So it's an igneous rock um, from the Devonian. And then the other half of the Hubbard Brook va Valley is made up of schist, which is that metamorphic rock, which is made from those, um, those ocean sediments that were turned into rock and then subjected to heat and pressure. And those are a little bit older. Although we might know the geologic story from a lot of field work that, um, that folks did, and we might have a view of what the topography of the landscape looks like. It's quite hard to, um, to know what's going on on a, on a small scale because, it's, because reading the underground landscape is not quite like walking through the woods, right? We can't, we can't walk below ground and see how, um, how the rock and soil are changing in depth or composition. So we have to get a little dirty if we want to really understand what's going on underground. And so what we're going to do is um, I'll show lots of, of pictures and of uh, soil and rock in some of the slides to, to come, but I want to set up kind of the, the model or our, our science un backed understanding of what Heber Brook looks like if you slice it like a layer cake. And this applies to a lot of um, forested mountain um, uh, areas in the Northeast. So this is what we might conceptualize the underground structure to look like. At the higher elevations, um, bedrock is really shallow and the plant community um, tends to include some more coniferous species. And what's interesting is, is how water works in these soils compared to the soils downslope. So the water table is shown here in um, light and dark blue colors. In the, in the uppermost soils, it saturates the soil every time it rains. Um, however, if we go downslope a little bit, uh, bedrock's pretty deep and 
the upper soil horizons or layers might not experience water as much as those uppermost soils. So the, the arrow marks the top of, the, of where the water reaches. Um, also in those, uh, those soils downslope, uh, the, there's actually a water table that is there all the time, not just when it rains, but that gets deeper and deeper as we go downslope. Finally, near the stream, the soils experience uh, water from that, from that stream um, saturating it. So I guess what I want to say about this slide is that um, there's a real pattern to how the soils and the, and the water um, patterns within the soils are changing as we go from high to low. And then also just to mention the forest community is changing as well. We end up having more deciduous species in those deeper soils. So now that I've given a broad view of how um, the landscape is structured at Hubbard Brook, I want to introduce you to the soil. And this is kind of the charismatic megafauna of the soil world, in my opinion. This is the spodosol. And actually, spodosol is the state soil of New Hampshire. It's not the specific one, but um, it's a good soil to know. And spodosols have uh, these distinct horizons that are different colors, and they have different properties. So the top one is organic for, um, with O, and, uh, and that's overlaying a lighter color, um, almost bleached looking horizon, which then is followed by darker kind of reddish B horizons, and then a C horizon, which might look pretty close to what all of it would have looked like when the glacier deposited um, these sediments before they turned into soil. But turn into soil they did. So these spodosols form from the interplay of water and minerals and sources of acidity. And when I say sources of acidity, you can think of, um, well, this might be seltzer. It's after 5 p.m., so no judgment if it's, if it's anything else on your end. Um, but anything that has carbonic acid in it um, or that is carbonated, uh, is going to be a weak acid. In addition, uh, the decomposition of leaves and, and pine needles creates organic acids. And when those are, um, are percolating through the soil with water, through water, they're really good at breaking down minerals like this mica mineral uh, biotype. And what that does is it leaches metals and carbon from this from the upper horizons, the O and E horizons. And then those sticky metal carbon um, compounds uh, end up uh, staying behind in the B horizons. So it's a leaching of metals and carbon from the upper to the lower horizons, which gives it that nice color. Just some, some other words I might use. In Russian, spodosol is known as a podzol. And then in Abeniki, uh, the word for spodosol is asakwamki, which means uh, sandy soil under moss. And here's another example of this sandy soil under moss. So as you're walking around the mountains, uh, you might sometimes see what looks like an ashy gray uh, pocket of soil under moss or, or on the trail. And um, I always smile when I see those because it's a sign of this E horizon. And it's really common at the upper elevations. That um, the term for the this leaching process is generally within soil science known as eluviation. So like the sideways or downward movement of dissolved or suspended material within soil. But within spodosols in particular, it's known as keluviation, which is this weathering of minerals and then transport of those metal carbon compounds. And I, I gave you a little diagram um, of, of iron, which is stuck to some oxalic acid. Again, water and acids are, are important to this. So to go back to our model of what the underground structure looks like, uh, these spodosols uh, are, are um, 
are the most dominant soil type at Hubbard Brook at the lower elevations. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call them kind of the typical podzol here. But if you travel up, like I mentioned before, there's thinner soils over bedrock at the upper elevations. And these are often composed of just one of the spodosol horizons uh, over bedrock. And then downslope, uh, we'll see a different um, horizon, dominant horizon. So it's almost like we kind of tilted the spodosol on its side because of this, this influence of water. So lateral patterns of water are leading there to be horizontal leaching from the upper soils. And then um, those compounds are getting deposited in the middle so soils versus those deeper, more vertically influenced soils. What's nice is since this involves um, water and topography, so we can model the distribution of these soils pretty accurately using elevation data or LIDAR. You might know that uh, the name of that. Um, so by taking uh, information on the topography and elevation of the landscape, we can map with pretty good accuracy the distribution of these different soil types. And I don't want you to get overwhelmed by the legend or the details here, but the different colors on this big map represent different soil types. And uh, folks at Hubbard Brook have been able to model the soil distribution with around 70% accuracy. I know that's a C minus, but for soil modeling, it's pretty good because soils are really complicated. Of course, uh, a model is nothing without the, the data that informs it. So um, it's, it's kind of fun that, uh, that a ton of soil pits have been dug in this particular watershed of Hubbard Brook, would say um, over 200 maybe. And then a student and I went around and uh, did a bunch of poking with an auger and we collected 500 more uh, points uh, of data about how the soil is, um, about the soil variation in the landscape. This gave us some, um, some interesting data, which is not going into my dissertation, but I want to share it with you all. So first of all, with the map on the left, we can see that there's patterns of soil thickness, even though there's a lot of variability uh, as we go from high to low. And just recall, if you will, that um, that bedrock was pretty shallow in the upper parts of the landscape. That would be the lighter colors on this on this map, um, and that's where we see some of the some of the um, the the uh, the thinnest soils here. So those those lighter colored points, and then the deeper soils are given in the darker red colors, and those tend to occur lower down. That shallow bedrock pattern is also evident in the map on the on the right, so we can really see where um, where bedrock is encountered versus where the deep till lies, and that till can be up to like six meters deep. And it's amazing because you'd be walking around the landscape and not really know that there's like this slow change um, between shallow bedrock and deep till. Uh, but it's but it's there all the same, and that's why I think investigating it is is rewarding. And now on to ground truthing the the model. So I should disclose that some of these points are actually used to construct the model, but when looking at our auger data, it was really um, really cool to see how closely our characterization of these soils matched the, the map that the model created. So that was affirming that some of the patterns of um, hydrology or water movement and soils are, um, are, are definitely responsible for some of the variation in soils. So I want to back up for a second and just ask, you know, why do soil patterns matter in the first place? Well, for when, when I mentioned um, that those B horizons are, are where um, metal and carbon compounds 
um, are stored, that's important from a carbon sequestration uh, standpoint, right? So those mid-slope soils that are all bee horizon are quite effective at, um, at storing carbon in the landscape, especially compared to the shallow soils that just consist of an E horizon. These, so, um, these soil patterns are also important from a nutrient perspective. So uh, there was a lot of acid deposition in the Northeast that spiked you know, 50 or so years ago. And that uh, led to a lot of uh, leaching of, of calcium out of the soils, which is important to species like sugar maple and, um, and, and can influence red spruce health. Uh, so knowing where soils are that, um, that are particularly good for releasing calcium or, uh, or where uh, aluminum toxicity isn't a thing are, are important for knowing the, um, the health of these species. And then finally, uh, soil patterns can help us predict soil functions across the landscape. So different soils store different amounts of water, support different ecosystems, and if we can understand how they vary in the landscape, we can predict some of those functions. So um, I won't go too into the weeds, hopefully, uh, but I want to tackle two of my dissertation questions, which I've kind of simplified here so that I can show the most images possible. Um, but uh, two, two of my questions are, one, how do you pattern, these patterns of water and topography and chemistry that I've talked about affect mineral weathering in soils? And as I said, mineral weathering is a, an essential process of spodosol formation. And we know that there are these lateral um, spodosol forming processes, but um, no one's really looked at the effect on, on chemical weathering in these soils. And then um, I was interested in how these patterns affect weathering in rock fragments and whether there's a relationship between the soil properties and rock porosity. And finally, whether these rocks might be important in certain soils from a nutrient perspective. Uh, this required a lot of field work and um, I couldn't have done it with all, without all the folks uh, who came out, including Rebecca, who's in the audience. And it also required a lot of participation by black flies and deer flies and moose flies, who I'm sure you all have encountered before and will again. Here's a look at some of the soils that I showed you um, in conceptual sketches, but here's the actual photos. So that soil that's just an E horizon that's been strongly leached in position one on the little diagram, this is what it looks like. So it's got, again, a shallow kind of bleached looking horizon over bedrock, even though you can't really see the bedrock very well here. And um, above that, it's got a pretty thick organic horizon as well. And then just a little bit down slope, just a few meters even, um, we'll get this really deep uh, BHS puzzle or just 80 centimeters of B horizon, basically. And essentially it's it's captured a lot of those metal carbon compounds from the upslip soil. Uh, we didn't get to bedrock in this pit. And then finally, here's here's what it looks like a little bit more downslope. And this is the most common soil type at Hubbard Brook. So uh, I like this picture because we went out with some high school students and then a sunbeam just like shown perfectly on the pit face. And I think it's rather a pretty spodosol. So I wanted to include it. For my work, I studied three main locations in the watershed. I, uh, I used basically a transect ap approach and dug nine pits, but also used data from my collaborator who dug nearby pits to, to put in shallow wells to monitor the water. And then we also had some deep glacial till samples that we used. So we did some 
fancier science related to um, the chemistry of the soils, but I just want to show some real basic patterns here. Um, and I don't know that I'm even going to explain box plots because I just want you to see that there's trends within three elements as we go from different soils. So on the on the y axis here is just amount of the element, which I've listed in the corners there of each plot. And then on the x axis is each soil type. And what happens is the um, for each element, the lowest concentration is basically in these in these super leach soils, and then the highest is in the um, the lowermost soils. So we've got these gradients in in these three really common soil elements, which is might be particularly important for sugar maples, for instance, which need calcium. I also uh, made thin sections out of soil clods to look at the minerals on a more detailed scale. This basically involves collecting a soil clod and then gluing it into a puck, sawing it in half and mounting it on a slide to study with a microscope. And I did this with rock fragments and, uh, and bedrock cores, but um, I'll get to that a little later. Here's what, um, what a soil clod looks like. So this is a three by four centimeter image. And I find it cool because you can see some of the microstructure of the organic matter and the mineral particles. The minerals, um, most of them are kind of lighter in color here, whereas the humus is, or the organic matter is darker. There's actually a, a small fragment of Kinsman granodiorite, uh, which is, if you remember, in the western part of the Hubbardbrook Valley. That's been kind of blasted apart, but the skeleton is still there in the soil. Although we can look at it with our eyes, I also used um, electrons to, to study these soil clods to map each element at each pixel or each each location in the clod. And that gives us a map like this of which allows me to um, to know which minerals in the soil are where based on those elements. So uh, it, it was a fun exercise to see the mineral diversity in the soil. And I was especially interested in plagioclase, which is this feldspar mineral in green. It is really common um, and it's also um, it weathers pretty easily. So using all that soil cloud data, I compared the amount of plagioclase in different soils in nine different soils and found that um, over half was missing from the um, the uppermost soils in comparison to the lowermost soils, which had um, a fair amount of plagioclase remaining. So the missing stuff is in red here and missing since like the inception of that soil. So an assumption is the weathering has happened since the glaciers retreated. And you'll notice that the three elements that I showed, calcium, sodium, and aluminum are all part of the mineral composite, mineral form, formula of plagioclase. So while we were doing all this work, it was amazing to see um, what, what uh, to, to kind of observe the rocks in the forest and uh, start to develop some hypotheses about how these gradients in water and chemistry might be affecting them. This is a tree tip up that uh, peeled kind of all the organic stuff off the, the surface of this um, of, of the bedrock here. And I believe this is the Rangely schist. Yeah, so um, going up close, you can see the relief that's kind of created under this organic mat, uh, that there's a lot of uh, topography here um, just on the rock because uh, stronger minerals like quartz or more resistant minerals are are sticking up and others have been weathered. But rock doesn't stay bare for very long in the forest. Just want to reinforce that 
you know, there's a lot of biologic activity, which is really potent at weathering things. So I, I like to include this image because it makes me laugh uh, and say a rolling fir bee gathers no moss, but if you leave something long enough, you know, it's going to it's going to ra rapidly be attacked by all these biological agents. And the signs of this are clear in the soil. So here's a soil clod that has a reddish orange feature from oxidation from a root. You can see there's someone's drilled a little hole in this soil clod on the far left. Well, it's actually a little root that's that's gone in and um, and the oxygen and the, the air that um, that that root is is respiring leads to the, the oxidation of minerals around it in a circular pattern. Um, it's also pretty common to see rocks cleaved in two, whether by frost action or by roots or some combination, um, can't be sure. And then um, finally, I was struck by how many roots and mycelium I would see kind of surrounding rocks. So on the top, there's another tip up where roots are are encasing a pretty um, uh, rough looking rock. And then on the bottom, this is a rock from a soil pit that has fungal hyphae kind of encasing it in a web, but it's kind of hard to see that. So this got us interested in, in what was happening with weathering in the bedrock and the rock fragments at the um, hill slope scale. So here the bedrock, which is schist, is in green and the till um, rocks are in um, other colors. They're dominated by this granodiorite. And our hypothesis about where the weathering is strongest is in red. And the rocks look pretty different at different um, locations in the, in the landscape. Took a lot of field work. I didn't actually end up collecting that um, big rock, but I did sieve out a lot of rocks from soil pits. And again, I uh, mounted them on slides to study them. And this is where um, I want to introduce the work of Rebecca Schultz, who is an artist that came out in the field with us. And uh, we gave her some of our uh, our photographs from the microscope and she made these amazing paintings that you can see on her website, which is linked. And I, I think what um, what is, is telling is that you can see some of the same patterns that uh, that alert us to the mineral identity and the processes that are happening. You can see those also in her paintings. So this is a rock um, of granodiorite and the biotite is kind of highlighted in in pretty colors here. Um, and then this is the this is the schist. So uh, Rebecca also painted um, a version of of, of this this uh, bedrock uh, core as well. And this is what biotite looks like on the exterior of the rock fragments. So it, it's weathering kind of like a book left out in the rain, but um, other minerals are experiencing weathering as well. So um, the plagioclase that I've marked has these characteristically rounded um, uh, kind of wavy tunnels that are all the same diameter and those those are evidence of, of fungal weathering in these rock fragments. And we've seen it up close as well uh, with these, um, these amazing kind of dissolution or <laughs> these like these etched channels. So you can see a little um, filament in the middle of the photo on the left. And then on the photo in the photo of the right, uh, this is a little grain of calcium phosphate mineral. Okay. Um, I so so when we measured the porosity within the outer edge of these rock fragments, uh, it was clear that the average porosity um, displayed a gradient in these soils as well, uh, going from the uppermost soils to the lowermost ones. Um, 
And then I've included rock fragments that I collected from the deep till as well as the bedrock for a comparison. So porosity is on the y axis here. And so that kind of confirmed, you know, a hypothesis that weathering was also acting on these rocks. But what was cool is we kind of also discovered a threshold of rock decomposition for the till rock fragments. And that was around 12%. We didn't find higher porosity values than that. So um, I think that uh, when rocks hit that threshold, they start to fall apart for this lithology. Uh, what was also interesting is that the um, the rock fragments in deep till appeared more weathered than the um, parent rocks. So uh, maybe there was some weathering happening as the glacier was abrading them and so forth. To support some of our um, our analysis of porosity that we did with lower tech methods. Um, I was a rock doctor briefly and took them to a CT scanner. If you've ever gone to a CT scanner, it's the same process. I just did it with rocks at a non-medical facility. And that gave us information on porosity of a 3D rock and information on the mineralogy as well. I wanted to compare uh, the rock fragment porosity to the, um, the weathering in the soil and we found a really nice exponential relationship here. So um, this is interesting because around uh, when, when around half of the plagioclase in the soil was depleted, it seemed like the porosity really started to ramp up in these rock fragments. And even though I thought weight would or the size of the rock would be important, which is represented here by weight, um, it didn't seem to be uh, have a have a huge effect and maybe that's because some of those smaller rocks just got zapped. The mineralogy also uh, stuck out to me uh, as being important because in some of these rocks, they actually have uh, significant amounts of appetite, which is a calcium phosphate mineral, but the soil doesn't have any appetite in some of the shallow soils. So maybe these rocks act as a kind of slow release fertilizer. Um, phosphorus is tightly cycled in the organic horizons, but ultimately some of it is lost um, every year uh, in, in water. So maybe it's replenished from these rock sources. And these are views of, of soil versus rock. We also drilled for rock cores using a, um, a large well rig, which was actually um, installing deep wells, but we were able to recover deep, um, deep rock cores as well of, of schist. And I took around a backpack drill that helped us get cores that were around a, a foot long or sometimes more. Had some help with this. Uh, you can see it's it's COVID when <laughs> we're drilling in this video and Rebecca came out with us and helped, which was amazing. I think she's actually taking this video. Uh, it's a water assisted drill and uh, we were masking because we didn't know if COVID could travel in the forest. <laughs> Here's what some of those cores looked like and we were able to capture kind of a range um, a variation in the schist. I want to wrap up um, pretty soon, but I, when we were there, and there's more work that I have um, to do with the, the rock cores that didn't make it in this presentation. But what I found uh, really interesting is that um, although the soil seems to be a significant influence on rock weathering, there's still um, an influence by the rock properties themselves. So I don't want to get too bogged down in the details of this slide, but you're basically looking at two comparable rock cores that were com um, collected from similar areas in the landscape from the same side of the watershed, kind of over here in the yellow part. I think it might even be those two triangles that are really close together. But one of them has way more porosity in the top part than the other. And when we analyzed the chemistry of the minerals, we found that that was because this one had much more calcium than the other core. So 
um, small changes in the chemistry of the rocks can have an influence on the on the variation of that weathering. Just to give some takeaways, so we found that water and topography and chemistry create hill slope patterns of um, weathering and breakdown in soils of minerals. And these patterns are paralleled by the formation of porosity and rock fragments, which seems to really intensify when half of the soil plagioclase is depleted in this ecosystem. And we're testing that in other areas. And then finally, in some soils, rock fragments and bedrock are the only areas that we can find certain mineral nutrients. And with apatite being the only rock source of phosphorus, uh, that might be important from a nutrition perspective. I want to close by, uh, by going back to the images of the soil, because I love them. Um, so this is uh, remember a soil clod from a bee horizon um, that formed out of granodiorite, uh, granodiorite till, versus a bee horizon of a spodosol in Vermont that formed from a schist till source. So even though there might be similar um, processes afoot that lead to soil horizons and um, and soil types, the um, there's really beautiful and kind of dramatic differences uh, from the the rocks that um, that compose them. I love seeing all these like platy kind of weathering apart schists, and there's even a a chunk probably of it's hard to it's it's either a chunk of one of those um, kind of basaltic dikes or or maybe a volcanic, but it's it's fun. So to, to end, I just want to say that um, I, I'd encourage you to, whether it's through a road cut or just digging in your backyard or uh, trying to go out with a soil scientist, um, see if you can uh, see what's underground because there's a lot going on. These are some highlights of soils that I saw this summer. Tremendous uh, diversity of uh, water properties and colors and textures, even in a single clod. This one has a lot of modeling from um, from frequent uh, water saturation. So dig deep. And thanks to everyone who helped make this work possible. All right, happy to answer any questions you might have. And thanks for listening. Hey, Jenny, just a, a quick overall question. So you talked about some things that you found that were interesting and surprising. Is there anything that you didn't find that you expect to find when you started? That is such a good question. Let me think for a little second here. Yeah, anything that surprised you that you didn't find or didn't come across or a connection that wasn't made that you thought was probable? Yeah, that is a really good question. Uh, some of it has to do with, oh yes, there are a few things, let's see. Some of it has to do with the chemistry of the water. We were expecting to see certain patterns that we didn't oh i mean within the rock fragments i guess i thought i would see um elemental losses uh that were similar to the soil um but that just wasn't visible and i think what happens is it's kind of a more of a mechanical process than a chemical one that there's really not i i think the the chemical process that happens is the that biotite or the micas get um, oxidized and then the whole rock kind of falls apart. So there's not enough time for the plagioclase, for example, to weather like the soil minerals do. So that was a surprise. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and we had a, a comment and a question in the, in the chat. Um, 
So Marcia said she really liked your collaboration with the artist Rebecca Schultz on your slides and in the museum um, in our exhibit that just came down and your explanation of the differences between Vermont and New Hampshire geology are fascinating. And, and then she says, will you talk about any connections between the research you did in Hubbard Brook and your work in North Carolina? That's a great question too, thank you. Um, so my work in North Carolina feels very different because it's mostly in agricultural an agricultural setting, uh, but I think it's fascinating to think about um, soil properties and how we determine um, the um, the specific soil properties that allow it to support an ecosystem, be that an agricultural ecosystem or a forested one. Uh, so, yeah, I'd love to explore that more, but. Um, maybe in a future future talk. <laughs> I, I have a follow up question to that. I'm really interested in this idea of the rocks as this kind of slow release fertilizer and this sort of slow release um, chemical source of, of, of minerals. Um, I think, you know, in, in um, last month in the talk that Peter Groffman did for us, he talked a lot about the kind of acid rain research at Hubbard Brook and, and the kind of um, and I've talked with Scott Bailey some about the, the, the kind of findings they had in terms of calcium and the, some of the experiments they did at Hubbard Brook in terms of what happens if we put the calcium that we think was lost through acid rain back. And, and I'm, so that, your comments about that really stuck out to me. And I, and I wonder, I guess, if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about um, sort of what you think that means in terms of the kind of resiliency of the forest or the ability of these minerals that we thought were sort of leached out because of water pollution, air pollution. Um, I'm just, I'm really fascinated in this idea that like they're still there. It's just like, and it's not a total loss. Yeah, I'm really fascinated by it too. I guess uh, a few thoughts. One, it's hard to know. Um, I guess it, it does seem like a lot of the rock fragments in till have broken apart, especially in the most weathered soils, but unfortunately it's really hard to detect that. Um, the lowest like percentages of rock fragments in any of my soil pits were always at the upper parts of the landscape. So I think most of them got, you know, blasted apart. Um, what's hard to know is like how the, um, the, these like minerals are being accessed, whether it's like after they've fallen apart into soil or before. And I think when I was seeing a lot of like mycorrhizae like on the outside of the, the rocks, I, you know, I started to get really excited about that. And, um, and I started to talk with a researcher in, um, in, in an expert in, in mycorrhizae and, or sorry, fungal hyphae. Uh, and then COVID happened. We didn't actually collaborate, um, but uh, I think since then it, I've realized it's really hard to tell whether um, the biological uh, piece, whether they're seeking water or nutrients out of some of the some of these uh, these rocks. But it would be really cool to explore. And I I do think there's probably um, some some chemistry like equilibria at play with you know when you have a more acidified environment that's definitely putting pressure on the weathering of these rock fragments and so hopefully they act as a buffer against some of that acidification oh that is also a really good question thank you mark this is like um yeah perfect before i defend my phd um yeah, I've been thinking about that uh, lately, especially with, you know, the um, the Northeast uh, uh, expected to receive more extreme and frequent heavy rainfall events. So I guess that um, I would expect that to in, um, to have an effect on the uh, release of nutrients, the weathering. Um, I think my PhD candidate friend who works more at the water side might have more of an idea of how that plays out. 
But I would also say that with winters expected to change a little bit and um, earlier springs perhaps and um, more freeze thaw events, we might actually see some uh, some blurring of these spodosols. And that's been predicted, um, I guess, is it, is it in Pennsylvania where um, there's, or some folks predict that the soils in the Northeast might eventually someday look a little more like, like the soils in Pennsylvania, be more like inceptosols, I think, if they're not receiving the burst of snow melt that in the spring that usually generates a lot of the organic acids and, um, and leaching that creates them. I'm not an expert on um, on this side of it, but there's some really cool papers out there about like depodsalization in that vein. Thanks, Jenny. Other other questions? Feel free to put them in the chat, or we're we're a small group. Um, so there's another question in the chat. It says, "Could you estimate how much organic matter has grown in a square meter through time based on the rate of biologic and physical weathering?" Ooh, that is a great question. I think there's also going to be a lot that the microbes are doing to influence that and actually there's yeah there's some uvm <laughs> experts <laughs> about um in, in this domain too like um if there are earthworms working through that organic matter um i'm really curious about this connection between weathering and um and soil formation though and it's interesting to note that our thickest organic horizons are in the shallow soils with those E horizons. Um, so I think there is a, a synchronicity between the um, the chemistry of those soils and the and and the decomposition and the weathering. Which way it goes, I'm not I'm not totally sure. I think it kind of like influences each other. So really hard to untangle those. But that's a good question to ponder. Thank you to think about that. Hey, and you know, in, in previous conversations you and I have had about how like a, a square meter at the top of the ridge and a square meter at the bottom of the, you know, in down along the brook are just so different. It's been fascinating to to learn more about about that. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing all of this with you with us. It's it's great to learn more about your research and about what we're walking on when we walk through the forest. Um, it's been great. Thanks for having me, Megan. And thank you all for coming out yeah. and asking such great questions.